Hello, uh, hope you are enjoying the theory classes and the lab laboratory sessions. So uh, today we will uh, look, up a, look a, at a new product which is the CD player. A CD player uh, which may not be very uh, common nowadays because people have moved away from the, the CD player and uh, started with uh, more uh, uh, digital uh, uh, players. But uh, CD player is one of the uh, uh, pro one of the products which has got a lot of uh, uh, design features. So if you look at uh, a CD player, you will see very small small uh, components and uh, very uh, intricate uh, assemblies, which actually provides you a very uh, nice uh, uh, view of how a product can be designed. A very compact this product can be designed with uh, multiple functionalities. So. Uh, this product, uh, learning this product, uh, though the product is not very common nowadays, you will see that it has got many things which uh, a designer has to learn. A designer will be able to understand how uh, people design uh, such complex products. And there are many such complex products in the market, uh, uh, not exactly CD player, but most of them will actually take the, uh, the, these design concepts in developing new electronic products. So, uh, what we will be doing here is again uh, as in the other cases, other ex uh, exercises, we will go through the complete dissection of the product and then identify all the small, small parts and uh, small assemblies and uh, many uh, complex uh, structures inside. And then finally, we will look at the product uh, from the design point of view and then see uh, what is the portfolio architecture that we can actually think for this product. So, in the product architecture, we mentioned that uh, there are two uh, things which we need to understand when, when it comes to the architecture. One is the, the architecture of the product itself and then the, the portfolio architecture. So, how many uh, members should be there in the family of the product and then that actually depends on uh, uh, many things like uh, the market requirement, customer segments and customer uh, preferences, etc. So, uh, since we do not have any uh, market survey at this stage, so we, you have to make some assumptions about the market variations, market segments and the customer preferences. So, based on that you will try to create a, a portfolio architecture for this product. So, uh, we will uh, go through the, the product dissection as in the previous case, uh, cases, but uh, at the end of uh, this you need to uh, create a, a portfolio architecture also by looking at the methods that we discussed for portfolio architecture and then identify how many products should be there and in that product uh, what, what way the uh, sub assemblies to be made or uh, uh, the modules to be made in order to get a different architecture for the product. So that is what we are going to see in this class. Okay, So the understand the functioning of the product and identify all the parts, prepare the parts list and for some identified needs prepare the need metric chart. Okay, so that will be interesting here because you prepare the needs for the customers and then prepare a need metric chart and then prepare the portfolio architecture based on assumptions for the distribution of customer requirements. So once you have the some customer needs identified, you try to identify what will be the uh, customer requirements and uh, the variation in the customer requirements for that particular need and that will give you some idea about what is the way it is distributed and what are the different segments of customer that you will be having and based on that you can prepare the uh, portfolio architecture. Again we have uh, seen few examples of portfolio architecture in the class theory class. So use those principles and then try to prepare the uh, portfolio architecture. Okay, So this is the uh, uh, drive, so it is a DVD drive and this is made by Samsung and the model is CTO Edge. Okay, so the CD or I mean DVD, uh, the internal structure uh, almost remains the same except for the uh, reading and other methods, but uh, the, the design or the mechanical design will almost the, the same. Okay, so the major functions are basically to read data, write data, spin the CD, secure and lock the CD. So you will see that uh, there are multiple uh, uh, functions to be uh, achieved in the product in order to basically data storage. So you can actually say store and read data is primary function. So it has to store data and then uh, retrieve data from the, uh, the disk. So this uh, that is the main uh, purpose and to do that you need to read, write and then spin the CD in order to do the reading and then you need to secure and lock the CD. So these are some of the sub function that you need to do. So as the explains different uh, 
components and sub assemblies you will uh, you will be able to understand okay what is the role of that particular part or the sub assembly in the in providing the main function to the product okay so the procedure again uh, almost the same but uh, what we need to do is basically the uh, customer requirements identify the customer requirements uh, requirement statistics and then design the portfolio architecture that is going to be the difference in this case uh, compared to the other exercises so uh, the the primary part the first part remains almost the same that you go through the parts and then assemblies and then structure and things like that but uh, uh, at the end of this exercise go for a customer requirement statistic so basically make some assumptions about the customer requirements and the, the, stat the distribution and then uh, prepare the portfolio architecture based on that so this is what uh, what is expected and the report will be the format again almost the same in uh, the previous cases also you will be doing the product details and uh, product history and then uh, you will be going through the parts list then assembly chart and then finally the portfolio architecture so complete this uh, 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 portfolio architecture and then submit your reports so the TA will be explaining to you in detail about the product and how the product functions and what are the internal uh, parts and uh, how the each part is contributing to the main function of the product. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Today we will be looking at uh, a DVD drive and a old school film camera. So let us start with the DVD drive first. Now let us look at the interface. So we have this is what is called as an IDE interface. This preceded SATA that is used today, and this is the power input, and then you have other uh, pins basically. So this uh, this basically should basically slide into the computer case. It means you cannot have any projections on the outside. So it's so it, the projected uh, area or the project the projection of this uh, CD drive should be a uh, right, I mean, should be in the shape of a rectangle. So that is why you will find all the fastness here are recessed. So you will find all the fastness that the device uses are recessed. That's why they are kept a little bit below the surface, primarily because you do not want any any of the screws sticking out of the device. So you do not want. So you want all the fastness that are uh, holding the device together to be recessed, primarily because you don't want any of them sticking out. Otherwise, if they stick out, they will basically interfere during assembly. So that is why they are, they are basically kept below the surface of the drive. So to speed up, I have removed uh, three of the four fasteners. Let me remove the fourth fastener. Now that I have removed, now I can take it apart. But before that, we have to remove the front case of the device. So this is held in place by a snap fit. So how we remove snap fit is basically we take a flat end screwdriver and then we basically depress the snap to release it. So once it is done, it is released. There are no fasteners holding this in place. So you have these snaps here. Basically, you can see they basically flex. And once I remove all four fasteners, I can basically remove the low, lower uh, lower case. So now that we have removed all, all four screws, we can proceed to dismantle the outer casing. You can see at the bottom casing, there is a small rubber pad. This is called as a thermally conductive uh, medium. So basically this contacts the processor and transfers the heat to the entire case. So the entire case now functions as a heat sink. So when, whenever you're dismantling a product, we should uh, keep these things, we should pay attention to the closest, finest uh, details. So, so when the, so you can see this particular IC basically has a metallic component here that contacts this, what we call as a thermal pad and transfers the heat to the casing and uses the entire casing as a heat sink. If we, if we did not use this, we have to put another passive uh, fins on top of this, uh, uh, IC. Since we already have a metallic component with a very large surface area, just by using a simple component like this, we can basically convert the an otherwise uh, uh, 
member of the uh, system that is meant only for covering the device and use it as a means of absorbing the heat from the uh, processor and dissipate to the environment. Now let us proceed to uh, dismantle the top portion of the case. So it basically slides out and comes out and we have another interesting uh, uh, piece. So we will cover this a little bit later. So now let us look at the DVD drive itself. So what you see uh, is basically, now let me pull this out. So this is the loading tray and then this is where we typically we load either the CD or, or a DVD, the optical medium that is to be read. You load it, once you load it and press the button in front of the device, there is a motor, motor here, the rubber belt is missing that basically drives the mechanism and then loads it in place. So since uh, it is not powered, I am manually operating it. So that basically loads the, uh, that pulls the uh, optical medium into the device. Now we'll go in uh, step by step in detail, uh, we'll cover every part of the mechanism. So now let me proceed to dismantle the device. Okay, now let us start with the key components of the device. The key components are as follows. So we have a central spindle that basically carries the either the DVD or the CD. Now this motor is a uh, brushless DC motor. We call this as an out runner motor, right? It's there are no uh, brushes here. So basically we call this as a brushless motor. And on top of it, we have a rubber pad that basically provides friction because when the DVD sits on it, sits on the spindle, we do not want any slippage occurring between the DVD and the spindle. So basically just to improve the coefficient of friction, we have a slight rubber coating on top of it. And there are, I am not sure if this is visible on the camera, there are small flexures here, That there are small flexures here, I, I, I hope you can see them. So they move in and out and they basically uh, provide a, uh, you know, additional uh, centering and grip to the DVD such that it stays centered. So you have these members flexures we call them. So basically they engage the uh, inner inner uh, outer part of the uh, ho hole in the hole of the DVD and it helps in centering as well as holding it in place. So this is as far as spindle is concerned, uh, these are the main uh, functional aspects. Now let us look at the main uh, optical drive mechanism. So basically optical drive can, uh, the uh, lens can traverse back and forth to read the data which is in the shape of a Archimedean spiral. So the, it starts at the uh, innermost part of the disc and then it, it spirals outwards. So to read it, basically we have to basically uh, think of uh, rotating it and then you read one long track that is in the shape of an Archimedean spiral. Now to do that, we basically spin the disc and then we move the uh, lens backwards and forward. There is another motor at the bottom that helps in moving the uh, mechanism backwards and forward. We look at it uh, when we take that apart. Now let us remove the loading tray. So you can see there are no fasteners here. What I just did is there are these two flexures that you can see which have these projections that basically engage certain projections on the housing. So when I assemble them, it will just go but if I pull them it will not come out. So for us to release it all we have to do is press it and then remove it. So pressing them basically moves them inwards and then releases them from the latch that holds them in place. Now we can get a much better look at the mechanism. Now so this is the motor. So now we can take a much better look at the mechanism. So this is the main motor that drives the loading mechanism. So you, there is supposed to be a belt here, sorry about that it is missing. So once the motor uh, drives it, it moves this pulley here that drives a, another, uh, another gear here. So there is a, let me take this out. As you can see, again there are no fasteners. There is a small flexure with a snap fit here 
that holds the pulley in place, the pulley on the other end has a small pinion gear. So to, to assemble it in factory, all the workers have to do is keep it in place and then press them. There are, so there are no special tools needed. So this basically speeds up the manufacturing process and then also simplifies the mechanical design of it. So you can see in the entire mechanism, all the uh, gears are held in place by a small snap fit flexure. So once this is powered, you can see there is a compound gear train that drives another larger gear. Basically this is to reduce the speed of the motor and basically increase the torque that is available from this small motor. So this motor can run at a very high RPM. It's, this is a brushed motor. In contrast to this, this motor is a brushed motor and it gives, gives very little torque but can run at a decent RPM. So we have this compound gear train basically to reduce the speed and basically to increase the torque that is available because we are moving this disc back and forth which is also carrying a, the optical medium. At the bottom of the tray, if you observe, you can see the, you can see a rack. So basically this rack engages this large, large gear here. And you can see the rack does not go all the way through, it ends just before the uh, end of the mechanism. Now there is a reason for that, I will explain. And then if you pay careful attention, in addition to the rack, there is also a slide here and then you can see the, it is sort of curved here. There is a reason for that, I will explain. And then you can see there is another guideway here. There are two guideways. There is a guideway here, another guideway here and then you have a rack. Now the entire thing is designed such that the user need not, the person who is assembling the device is not even aware of any of this. All they have to do is, they have to put the loading tray in place and then they have to push it. The mechanism self aligns basically. Now that is the beauty of this design. Now let us look at the workings of this device. So you can see, you correct Arga. So when the motor powers it, so basically that powers this gear, this gear in turn engages the rack. So basically this is a pinion and this is a rack, so it is a rack and pinion mechanism. So basically when it runs. So basically it engages, so because this will obscure the view, I have removed it. So normally what will happen is, when this gear is rotating, this will basically pull the tray inwards, all the way inwards. Once the tray reaches the end, what happens is, this pinion will be disengaged from the rack. So that is why you do not have the rack all the way to the end of the tray. So the, the once the pinion, what, sorry, once the tray reaches the end, now your rack, now your pinion is disengaged from the rack, which means the tray has reached tray has reached the its travel limit, right. Once that is done, what will happen is, you have a secondary cam mechanism, this white, white color mechanism that you see, that will basically engage and, so that will basically engage and you can see the, basically the reading mechanism go up and down. Right, let me do it once again. So once it reaches, the mechanism so it moves from the bot, bot from the bottom it moves up now what happens is the disc is sitting on top of this tray now the disc is basically lifted up from the tray so if the disc were to rotate it will start rubbing the tray basically so what happens is so once you load the disc it's taken inwards and from the bottom it is lifted a couple of millimeters just 2 or 3 millimeters by the reading mechanism. You can see the entire reading mechanism is sitting on four what we call anti-vibration mounts. These are anti-vibration mounts. It is sitting on a rubber bushing basically. You can see I can basically move the entire mechanism. That So you can see basically, uh, you can basically see the reading mechanism sits on four anti-vibration mounts. So when I move it, you can see it has it is, it is basically suspended in space by these four mounting, uh, anti-vibration mounting bushes. The reason is, if there, if there are any undue vibrations from the mechanism, it should not be transferred to the case. Also, uh, any vibration is also absorbed by the damping of the rubber uh, bushings here, right. Now let us proceed to uh, dismantle the device further. So all I have to do is just pull it off, so you can see. Now I have completely taken out the, uh, the optical uh, part of the DVD player. You can see, 
there is another motor, third motor that basically drives the lens back and forth. Now you can see all the cables, these are called ribbon cables. So since this has been used several times, you can see it is a bit, uh, so since it, is a, it has been used several times, you can see it is a bit abused. So don't worry about that. Now you can see this is similar to a lathe, lead screw mechanism. So we have a screw with a very, uh, with, uh, sorry, uh, so we, what's that so much? So we have a mechanism that basically drives the uh, lens up and down. Now you can see the lens basically sits on two guide ways. So these two rods basically enable in moving the lens back and forth in a straight line. So it moves back and forth in a straight line. Now to drive the lens back and forth, we have a third motor here that basically powers the mechanism through the use of a lead screw mechanism. You can see when the motor rotates, it can basically move the mechanism up and down. Now you can read about uh, the way uh, a lathe's uh, lead screw moves the carriage. This basically follows the same uh, principle. Also another thing to notice, the lens itself, the lens mechanism itself. You can see the lens basically is sitting on a number of flexures. So if I slightly apply a small force, you can see the lens mechanism move up and down. The optical diode itself, laser diode that basically reads is at a, it's at a 90 degree angle from this axis. So it's orthogonal to it. So the reading mechanism is sitting in this axis. Now the lens is sitting in this axis, so it's orthogonal. The reason why this is sitting on a flexure is, so basically it helps in focusing the beam on the disc. So in operation, basically this uses a invisible uh, uh, light, basically you have, uh, uh, in, I mean uh, it's invisible so we cannot see, see it in practice. So there are interlocks on the device that prevent you from seeing it because it is a DVD writer, it can basically burn your retina. So as, as soon as you take out the uh, electrical components from the device, so basically you cannot uh, basically operate the device. So there are safety mechanisms in place that prevents you from running the device if you remove the casing. Now let us look at the loading of the uh, DVD itself. Now let me put it back. So let me, I mean, let me show you the bushing itself. So this is the bushing, you have these two grooves. So you have these two, so you have these two grooves that basically carry the mechanism. So you can see it is very compliant, it's very soft. So basically I can, I am supposed to basically remove a screw at the bottom and assemble this, for lack of time I am doing this. This is not the way you should assemble it. You should basically remove the, this screw. This screw basically you have to remove the screw and then put, put the uh, bushing and then tighten the screw. Lack of time I am doing this. But this is not how you are supposed to assemble this. Okay, now it is in place. Again you see there are no fasteners that are required. Just by deformation, we are relying on deformation for it to assemble. Okay, now it is in place. So let me show you the loading mechanism once again. So you can see it can go up and down. Also you can, so you can see the loading mechanism go up and down. So you can see there is another cam here that basically engages this mechanism that makes it travel back and forth. Also you, you find another grey colour component here, so th this has a sp special application. If there is a power failure and then if you if you would like to take the DVD out, what you do is you take a small pin and then you press this mechanism here that basically disengages this uh, loading, I mean uh, spindle mechanism 
So you can manually pull out the disk and then retrieve the disk. So that is the role of this, this lever that you see here. Now let us see the loading of the disk in action. Okay, now what happens is this, so let me manually index it. Now I am rotating this gear which would be normally powered by a motor. So I am manually rotating, rotating this by hand which will norm normally be powered by the motor. Now before that, let me take out another important component. So this is the top part of the spindle basically. There is a metallic insert similar to the uh, fan that we saw, fans boss. So there is a metallic metal plate that is embedded inside the device, it is an insert. It is magnetic. If you see the spindle has a magnet on top of this. So if I take a metallic piece, if I put it, you can see it is sticking to it. So there is a reason for this because if we simply let the DVD sit on it and, and rotate, it will not stay in place. So there is a metal piece here that basically clamps the DVD from both the ends. So let me continue with loading it. So you can see, now I am loading it. Now it is centered. Now once it is centered, you can see the spindle go up, right? Now it is not centered because I have tilted it. So what will happen is similarly, this tray is covering from the top, so this is sitting here. So what will happen is this will basically snap in place. Now you see the disc is centered, now it can spin freely. So it can spin freely, it is not rubbing against any of the components of the mechanism. Once if you would like to disen disengage, you do that just you do the straight opposite. Remember now see once the magnet moves down, uh, this loses contact, so this is basically held in place from on top part of the assembly, right, like so. So this is free to move about within this uh, mechanism, right. Now you can basically, uh, I mean the loading tray comes out and, you, and then you can pull out the disc. So these are uh, the key uh, aspects of this device. Now. One thing which I would like to mention is the way the circuit board is held in place. If you look at this, right, again there are no fastness, see. So we already saw this, this uh, IC here basically contacts. So it will be like this when the device is assembled. So inside this is how it will look. And then this basically contacts this and then transfers the waste heat that the IC generates, it is basically uh, absorbed by the heat sink that is the entire metal plate. Now you see the circuit board itself is not uh, held in place by fancy fasteners. Right? So all I have to do is put this here, so there is a snap here that locates here, that is it, there is another snap here, now it is held in place. There are no fasteners here. Okay, let, let us proceed to put the device back. So we take the top top tray, put it together. Before that, let me assemble this back in place. So you have these again, this, these are metal snaps. Now basically we have a locking mechanism and then the sticker basically prevents the user from rotating this in practice. So I had to basically cut a crease around the sticker to, to release the top portion of the mechanism. So you can see a simple sticker is actually functional part of the device. It is not just a sticker. The sticker also prevents this outer uh, part of the uh, entrapping mechanism to lock it in place. So I had to cut open the sticker to release the uh, top part of the mechanism to release this piece that basically holds the DVD in place. So basically I have not spoken about the ribbon cables, basically you will have uh, such cables here that basically uh, 
will be assembled like that. So these cables basically they can flex a lot. Reason is because you have the this mechanism, the optical part of the mechanism going back and forth, right? So this is missing the cable. These cables can basically bend. These are called traveling cables. So they have limited uh, bends. So that helps in uh, uh, transferring the information through a flexible cable. So basically that concludes uh, the DVD uh, player. Let us put it back together. Right. So you proceed to uh, fasten all four screws and the device is complete. To complete assembling the device, you go back and then remember these uh, snap fits. All you have to do is first locate the top portion, locate them in place, right, and then press them in place. So there are four of these. So there's a snap here, 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 and on the side. Now you have an assembled uh, piece. In addition, uh, there is a front portion. This is a little bit difficult to remove. So all you have to do is basically So in practice you, you just have to put a small pin, this just allows to use a small pin to eject the drive manually. Let me just take this out for a second. Okay, in practice this will basically slide in place like so. So how you will assemble is, now that I have put it. So let this stick out a bit. Okay. And then we put this. Now that completes the complete assembly of the DVD drive. Now let us look at the next product. Okay. So that concludes the disassembly and assembly of the DVD drive. I, I hope you found it informative. I urge you to basically, whenever you dismantle a device, basically pay clo close attention to the functional aspect of every single component. For instance, in this mechanism, uh, if I have not told you, probably you may not have realized, the sticker plays a dual role. The casing plays a dual role. The casing's purpose is not only to protect the device, but also serve as a heat sink for the device. The label that is on the top of the device, not only gives you the specifications of the device, but also function sort of a fastener that holds the top portion of the uh, lid to keep it in place. So you should always uh, you know, pay attention to the minute details of each and every component because the more number of jobs that a, a certain component does, right? you can minimize the number of components and reduce the number of components and ma ma make it cost effective. You can see the entire device, this cost about 1000 rupees, but you saw the number of components that are there. right? This did not take place in a single day. This has been, uh, people have been iterating it for more than three, four decades. And what you see is the final uh, optimized design that you see. It's actually very difficult to optimize this any further. It's not that it's impossible, it's, I mean, they are really well optimized. If you really uh, look at them, if you really do a, a functional decomposition, if you really study them, I mean, they are very, I mean, it's one of the most uh, interesting devices that I have found so far. Now, let us look at the next device, a digital camera, a film camera, right? Sorry, not a digital camera, a film camera. Right? So you may not be familiar with this. Unfortunately, I don't have a film roll to demonstrate you. I'll just explain how it works. So basically you have a film roll, you load it in place here, and then you have to basically pull the film and basically loop it around the take up reel here. So this is a semi-automatic camera. Now let us look at the camera, right? We have the uh, front lens. We have a viewfinder here. So this has a separate viewfinder. So this is uh, different from your DSLR wherein we call it, you know, uh, single digital single lens reflex, which means whatever you see in the camera is what you see in the viewfinder. So this is different. This is an old school design, wherein the viewfinder sees slightly different, uh, different from what you actually capture in the device. So, which means if you're photographing with this, you have to be very well aware of, you know, the there will be always a discrepancy between what you see in the viewfinder and what is photographed. So, as an old school photographer, if you talk to any old school photographs, they'll tell you about that. So, you have a viewfinder here. 
that is separate from the main lens and then you have the controls on top of the device so this you will be familiar you have the zoom digital uh, I mean uh, electronic zoom I mean electronic not in uh, electronic zoom so basically it is an optical zoom the it is motorized to control it we uh, press these buttons to make the lens move back and forth and then you have the flash on and off and of course the uh, uh, the snap button and it also has got a recessed on off button if you see look at the button layout you can see all other buttons project out except for the power button you will find in every camera the on off button will be flush with the surface there is a there is a reason for that we don't want to accidentally turn on a camera when it is in the case right if if there is any pressure on the outside case for instance the camera's case camera sits on this case like this if i accidentally press i don't want to accidentally turn on the camera when it is in the case so i reduce those chances by making the on off key flush with the surface also i don't want to accidentally turn off the camera when i'm using it so the user is makes a conscious decision to turn the camera on and off so, uh, sorry the user makes a conscious decision to turn the camera on and off and that is why you will find the on off button being flush with the surface of this right now let us look at the uh, film uh, loading uh, of this camera so you have a rechargeable battery here that powers the device technically speaking uh, you don't even need a battery uh, uh, for such a camera the reason why this camera needs a battery is you you need to power the flash and you need to power the electronics that basically drive the uh, uh, lens mechanism back and forth and also the mechanism that basically winds the film you can look at a camera called kb10 it's an old school camera you can i mean it does need a battery it does need a bat i mean you can look at a camera called kb10 a very old old school uh, kodak camera it uses uh, uh, double double uh, a batteries just to power the flash i mean i've used those cameras you can actually photograph even without the batteries so because it is using a chemical uh, 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 i mean you expose a, a silver uh, solution that is uh, applied on a film it works even without uh, electricity you can basically photograph without electricity which is not possible with a modern day camera now this camera is missing many pieces so i'll just uh, it's actually quite complicated i'll just go I mean, uh, take you through an overall view of uh, different components of it because if we re i mean it will really take me more than an hour to go through in detail of each and every aspect of it now we see the let us start with the film loading uh, arrangement we'll put the film here the canister will be here it will be in a cylinder you have to pull the film and then place it in the take up reel in this camera the take up reel is motorized which means all you have to do is pull the film keep it on here and if you see here there is a loaded uh, there is a spring loaded uh, roller here that basically makes sure that the film is pressed onto the roller when you close it and then you have additional mechanisms in place that basically track the movement of the film inside the camera because with every shot you have to advance the film by a certain amount to expose the next frame so that is all automatically that takes place right now let us proceed to dismantle the camera so so far uh, we've been using uh, larger screwdrivers so to take this apart you will use much smaller screws the screwdrivers sorry and these screws are very very easy to lose so we properly keep them in a ball right so let us proceed to remove all screws that that is holding the camera in place right i think i have removed uh, all of them right now that removes the casing you can see in the casing there is a uh, mo there is a provision for tripod mount now this is made of metal even though it is black this is a metallic piece and the entire uh, casing is plastic and then you can see these are rubber buttons basically that contacts the uh, uh, that contacts the uh, points on the circuit board to basically uh, i mean connect the contacts basically it shorts the contacts there that basically signals the uh, uh, circuit board to take appropriate action okay now let me take the final screw so that i can dismantle the entire thing right so just to show you okay you can see there are multiple uh, 
uh, motors here, you can see that there's a very large capacitor here. The reason is the battery that you have here cannot produce the necessary uh, uh, power to uh, operate the flash. So what it will do is basically, once you press the button, it will charge, I mean, as soon as you start the camera, it will charge the uh, capacitor. Once you press the, uh, once you take a snap, it will discharge all the uh, stored power at once to, uh, to basically power the xenon flash that is there here. So xenon flashes have very limited life cycles. Typically, uh, these bulbs last about 2000 to uh, 1500 cycles. Typically, they have very finite life and they produce a very strong flash. So you can see the viewfinder here and then you can see the actual lensing uh, mechanism. So, let me take up, take apart the, uh, show you the uh, gear train that basically drives the take up reel of the film. So you can see we have quite a, long gear train here that basically when this gear rotates this is connected to the motor you can see the other gears move and that basically engages the take up reel that is this black color drum here. So uh, the arrangement is set up like this so motor is placed all the way here so there is a planetary gear train here you, it's a very small planetary gear train you have the output which means I cannot back drive this mechanism. Right, so this is all synchronized. If you see, if I rotate the main gear, you can see the other gears rotate also. So this is to make sure the take up reel and the feed reel are properly synchronized. If there is a mismatch, the film will start to uh, pull out and it will lead to uh, problems. So that is why you have this complicated mechanism that ensures that the take up reel is properly uh, uh, powered to pull the camera and then advance the film after every uh, photograph is, is taken. And also after the film is exhausted, after you have completely made use of the entire film, you have to re-spool it back to the main, main cartridge. So you run the motor in reverse. So what happens is, now this uh, drum is not powered, it has to be disengaged. So there is a toggle mechanism here, I hope you can see it. So this is automatically engaged by virtue of design. So you can see it is engaged. So now when it is engaged, now the torque on this is so high. So actually I'll, I'll risk breaking this. So just take my word for it. When it is engaged, so I can take snaps and it will advance the film and start and it starts loading the take up, take up drum or the take up reel. After the uh, entire film length is uh, exhausted, the, the motor runs in reverse. So when it runs in reverse, this gear basically disengages and then this can rotate freely. So you can see the take up reel is now disengaged from the uh, main drive motor. So the main drive motor runs in forward and reverse. So typically if you look at uh, such systems, uh, they have, uh, I mean, they are, they are built with very close, very fine tolerances. So when it runs in forward, it, it moves in increments such that it will advance the film. When it runs in reverse, it will simply drive the uh, mechanism in reverse that basically disengages the take up reel, which means I can basically use that as an idler wheel, right? Now you can see I can rotate it by hand. You can see the this gear rotate here. So now the film is re-spooled back to the main cartridge. Now you have the exposed film safely inside the cartridge, which can be sent to the lab for properly developing the film. Now a few other things to note uh, in this are, let me put this back. So it is always a good idea to use a magnetic uh, screwdriver. Unfortunately, I don't have one. So when handling small screws, it is a good idea to use a magnetic uh, screwdriver. Actually, I'm having difficulty in locating the screw. There is a separate motor within the casing. It will take a much longer time if we start dismantling it. It is actually inside this that basically drives the 
uh, lens mechanism, the zoom mechanism, back and forth. And other things to keep in mind are these uh, LDR, light dependent resistor that you see here. Because back in the day, uh, you you cannot, you have uh, little control over the uh, ISO, what we call the ISO. These days, digital cameras, you can uh, in your, take your smartphone for instance, you can change your ISO, put it anywhere from 0 to 1000 to, I mean, 12,500, I mean, even expensive cameras can go as high as, you know, 25,000, you know, which means basically it talks about the sensitivity of the sensor. Back in the day, you bought films that are rated for a particular ISO, which means if I buy a 400 ISO film, I'm stuck to that, right? Yeah. See, which means if I buy a 400 ISO film, I'm, I'm stuck to that. So, so you also have this LDR basically. So what is the role of this LDR? For instance, if I'm shooting in very strong daylight, there is no need to basically power the xenon flash. So the LDR basically measures the light intensity outside the, uh, I mean, uh, the environment. And then basically, it will basically turn off the uh, xenon flash from operating. If I'm shooting in a dark environment, basically I can measure the uh, light in intensity with the help of the LDR. And then I can turn on the flash if necessary, right? So that is uh, something to, um, some key uh, details to remember. Another thing is, when you're uh, photographing uh, which, uh, with, with, uh, with this camera, basically, you have very limited number of exposures. Typically, around 35 to 30, 36 exposures, or even lower. So basically, you have to plan ahead uh, before you take any uh, photographs. So those are uh, some of the key details uh, of, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, of a old school uh, film, I mean, semi-automatic uh, uh, film camera. I hope you found it interesting. Now let us let us put it uh, back together. Okay, all we have to do now is Put the screws back to complete the assembly. So, a proper way to operate uh, uh, this is what we call as a watchmaker screwdriver is to keep your index finger on top of this and then use your middle finger and index finger to rotate. So, whenever you are turning a screw, uh, please don't do like this so you won't have good control because when you're handling a very fine screws the way you use them is you apply a slight axial load right keep your index finger on this so it has a freely rolling uh, so it has a freely rolling surface so what you do is you keep your index finger on top of it and then use your uh, i mean if needed you can also use your ring finger use your use your middle and uh, use your uh, sorry thumb middle finger and uh, ring finger to basically apply a torque on the screwdriver while also applying a slight axial load. You don't go around turning like this, that basically uh, you will end up, uh, you know, uh, damaging the head of the screw. Also, you'll end up hurting yourself. If this pokes into your hand, it's pretty dangerous. Despite its size, it's uh, quite dangerous. So the way you properly do it is, uh, first uh, keep the screw properly in its uh, place, locate it. When you do this, you also have good control. So, okay, let me take another hole. Yeah. So, you keep it there. So, you, you locate it and then you start rotating. See, now it's properly assembled. So, you do that for every screw. So, that is the key difference between a watchmaker screw and your normal screwdriver. This is a much more precision device and you have to have proper technique for using it. Okay, that completes the assembly of the uh, camera. I hope you found it interesting. I urge you to, uh, you know, go through Wikipedia's page and uh, explore uh, different designs, the evolution of camera itself. Uh, I'm sure you found this quite interesting compared to your uh, normal digital cameras these days because you need to have a lot of, you know, electromechanical devices here right to basically uh, okay so i'm sure you might have found this uh, 
the mechanical, the mechatronic arrangements uh, quite interesting when compared to you know a pure digital system that we have these days. Even though the photographic quality of the system we have is far superior to these uh, systems, back in the day they actually they were uh, you know uh, uh, quite a marvel to uh, hold. Even today, I mean, I'm sure uh, uh, you will find them quite uh, you know you know from an engineering standpoint they are quite interesting to uh, observe. Uh, from a product design standpoint, you can really learn a lot by exploring, you know, the finer details of uh, these mechanisms. I actually did not do justice to this device. There is a lot more to this device than what I told you. But I am hopeful that I have just uh, piqued an interest for you to explore, uh, you know, old devices uh, on your own and then get to understand, you know, from a functional, from a design standpoint and uh, basically get into the designer's head and then basically explore. Uh, the thought process of a designer as to how to you know, go about designing such a device. Thank you.